A lot is said about the perversion and cruelty of the Nazis during the war, but little about their personal lives. The Nazi leaders all had a rather peculiar relationship with their wives and intimacy, which makes one think that the Nazi mentality was twisted in all aspects, including sexually. In today's video, we're going to talk about some emblematic marriages of Nazism and their peculiar ways of relating. We will explore unhealthy relationships, submission, infidelities, and secret romances. Get ready for a journey into the intimacy of the homes of the most important Nazi leaders. Welcome to Military History. Let's get started. In Nazi Germany, women had an important role, but it was subordinated to the one assigned to them as the inferior gender. They were expected to be mothers, obedient, and submissive to their husbands. The ideal Nazi woman, although supportive of the goals and aspirations of the Third Reich, was supposed to be largely apolitical, and serious state matters were reserved for men prepared for such tasks. There are rumors that this comfort with the feminine is related to another aspect of the Fuhrer, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. The National Socialist wife was an exemplary mother, an elegant lady, and above all, a devoted homewoman to her husband. The image of the Nazi regime's family was very purist, so the domestic problems of its leaders had to be hidden. Let's explore some of the more perverse relationships they maintained with their wives. Martin Bormann, polygamist. Known for his brutality, rudeness, and virulent anti-Semitism, the head of the Nazi party, Martin Bormann, wielded enormous power as Hitler's private secretary. He controlled people's access to the Führer and was also in charge of Nazi party promotions and appointments. He was the man who ordered the structure. Few women personified the Nazi ideal of femininity better than Gerda Bormann, his devoted wife. She braided her blonde hair, avoided cosmetics, and wore traditional Bavarian attire, just like her nine children. Gerda was an unconditional Nazi, programmed to obey her violent husband, to the point of never questioning the atrocities committed by her husband, let alone his infidelities. In October 1943, intoxicated with power and alcohol, Bormann fell madly in love with a woman he flirted with at a party dance. The woman in question, Manya Behrens, was a dental assistant who had become an actress due to her stunning beauty. Despite his sacred marriage, Bormann obsessively pursued Behrens relentlessly until she finally succumbed to his courtship. In this case, there was no ounce of romancy. We are talking about an obsession bordering on the perverse that the Führer's secretary developed for this lady, to the point of confiding in his confidants, I must have her at all costs. Once the affair was consummated, months passed, and Bormann was forced to confess to his wife, Gerda, that he had fallen madly and deeply in love with his lover. Gerda, instead of feeling hurt or worried, had an innovative solution. Why not form a polygamous household together? According to the testimony of a Bormann house assistant, in the incredible conversation the Nazi couple had in private, Gerda enthusiastically told her husband, one year Manja has a child, and the next year I do too, so you always have a wife available. We will gather all the children in a house by a lake and be the perfect family. This statement suggests that the Nazi doctrine that saw women only as housewives and vessels for perfect children had taken hold in Gerda Bormann. The Nazi lady even suggested drafting a contract that would grant the mistress the same rights as the legitimate wife, and even suggested to her husband that a law should be passed in Germany giving healthy and valuable men the right to have two wives to perpetrate a superior Aryan race. For Bormann, a man with an unbridled libido that he perversely satisfied, it was a seductive idea. However, the trio did not last long. The mistress, Manja, had problems with the arrangement, feeling uncomfortable and harassed by the corrupt Nazi couple and left. Such were the calamities proposed by Bormann and his wife that Behrens preferred to exile herself 
and work 15-hour shifts in an armament factory rather than continue with the influential marriage of the Third Reich. Heinrich Himmler, False Celibate Heinrich Himmler was not always the fearsome Reichsfuhrer of the SS, one of the main responsible for the Holocaust and the architect of extermination camps. There was a time when he was a sensitive boy who in his early years was weak, nearsighted with a weak chin and like many other Nazi leaders, had little to do with the Aryan ideal. What cannot be denied is that he loved order and his mother, who pampered him excessively, adored him. During his childhood, Himmler's classmates claimed that he couldn't even kill an insect, which was a profound mistake considering that he would be the ideologue of the Nazi Holocaust that exterminated more than six million victims. In his youth, Himmler was not a believer in the later theory promoted by the SS of breeding Aryan children who would become a superior race to repopulate the Soviet Union. On the contrary, in his youth, he advocated sexual abstinence and avoided relationships with women since for him, chastity was considered the highest virtue of man and was brutally against relationships outside of marriage, masturbation, and prostitution. In fact, he wrote in his intimate diaries his hypocritical concerns about Germany's promiscuity. Das Entsetzliche heute in Deutschland ist, dass die Frauen nicht mehr Mütter sein wollen. Wären wir noch so wie die alten Germanen mit ihren Sitten und ihren gesunden Einrichtungen waren, ein königliches Geschlecht unter den Menschen. Given his thinking, it was logical that Himmler was reluctant to intimacy in the bedroom. But in this type of ideological profile, it is common for sex to both frighten and fascinate at the same time. The SS chief remained a virgin until the age of 20, after reading a book suggesting that young men should channel their sexual energy into more useful activities. Celibacy was also a way to turn his miserable failure with women into a virtue. But this phase would end after meeting Margaret Seagroth Bowden, seven years older than him. With her, Himmler gave free rein to his interest in the female sex, making his inexperience and initial insecurity towards women decrease to the point of generating great traits of egomania. After months of hysteria and sickening love letters, they married and had little Gudrun in 1929. After the rise of Nazism, little was left of that shy Himmler who advocated abstinence. After studying female sexuality and being fascinated by it, he became convinced that monogamy was a work of Satan invented by the Catholic Church and had to be abolished, allowing him to indulge in his wild sexual appetite. Consistent with his new theories, he unofficially separated from his wife and had a relationship with one of his secretaries, Hedwig Pothast, with whom he had two children. Another example of the cruel and perverse profile of the Nazi leader. Joseph Goebbels, the Sader. Goebbels, undoubtedly a genius of propaganda in the service of the Third Reich, was a depraved individual and sexually obsessed with women. He felt inferior to them and to the Nazi Superman given his diminished physique and lame leg. According to him, his physique did not correspond to his great mind and ambition for power. Documents from the time recount that he was nicknamed the ram by the many actresses and society ladies. He tried to seduce, due to his small stature and almost pathological need to mount his sexual prey. He was also described as manipulative and ruthless, to the point of threatening young girls with suicide if they did not agree to share the bed with him. This was the profile of a perverse man who met Magda Rachel, who would end up being known as the First Lady of the Reich. In 1930, Rachel attended a Nazi meeting and was impressed by the fierce propaganda minister Goebbels. They started a romantic relationship in February 1931, but there was an obstacle in the new couple's relationship. Adolf Hitler. Magda met the Fuhrer shortly after starting to date Goebbels and was immediately fascinated by him, to the point of falling into a platonic infatuation which the Nazi Chancellor reciprocated gallantly. 
Hitler wanted to establish a relationship with her and keep her close, so he came up with a strange proposal. The idea was for Magda to marry Goebbels, a situation she enthusiastically accepted. Magda was devoted to the Führer, and although her tragic infatuation was stronger than what she had with her husband, she understood that this was the only way to stay close to Hitler. Magda and Goebbels married in December 1931, although he was uneasy about her adoration for the Führer. To the point of writing in his private diary, she loses herself a bit with the chief. I am suffering a lot from this situation. I didn't sleep a wink last night. Despite fearing infidelities from his wife, he himself cheated on her repeatedly, but one of these affairs had consequences with the Führer when he had a romance with the actress Lida Berova in 1938, as recounted by the protagonist in this file. He invited me to tea with several actresses. It was noticeable that it was always only women. The actresses went in and out of his house, and I kept thinking to myself, this man must have something special beyond his charm. Of course, some actresses also wanted to use his position as Reich's propaganda minister, and thus head of the film industry for their advantages, you know. Goebbels was smart, very smart, and a great man, but I never loved him. Through sinister Goebbels confessed the relationship to his wife and asked her if the three could coexist, proposing a polygamous relationship. Magda asked for time to think about it and went to ask Hitler directly if she could divorce, but he forbade her from doing so. It must be understood that the Goebbels Mariak was one of the exemplary homes of the Nazi regime, and the leader could not allow that Meg to collapse. Magda reluctantly accepted Hitler's decision due to the devotion, love, and fanaticism he inspired in her and remained with Goebbels until their tragic and dark end. According to testimonies of the time, the Fuhrer fantasized about having a clandestine affair with Magda and she also with him. However, historians believe it is unlikely that Magda and Hitler ever consummated their relationship. Rudolf Hess, asexual or intimate friend of the Fuhrer? Rudolf Hess, the Fuhrer's second-in-command, met Ilse, his future wife, when he was 26 and she was still a high school student. The young girl fell in love and pursued him, but he resisted. Historically, Hitler's lieutenant was a virgin and had a tortured relationship with his body and sexual desires. The couple dated for several years, during which Hess showed no interest in sex but they were bound by a much stronger and sinister shared love. Hess and his girlfriend saw Hitler giving a lecture for the first time around 1920 and immediately fell under his spell. It was their shared response to the Fuhrer that forged an unbreakable bond between them and sustained their asexual relationship. However, after seven years without sex, Hess did not seem close to proposing to Ilse as they formed what would be the National Socialist Party in 1927, while Ilse, Hess, and Hitler dined in a cafe. The Nazi leader took the woman's hand, put it on Hess's hand, and proposed marriage. None of the fanatics could refuse, and by December of that same year, both devout Nazis had married. They moved into a small apartment in Munich, but as Hess's aversion to sex persisted, Ilse complained to a friend that she felt like a convent girl. Hess's celibacy is a great mystery that continues to this day. However, there is a strong and surprising theory. There is a question that has circulated in the heads of the most famous historians for decades. What was the true nature of the relationship between Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Hess? It is widely known that the latter was a kind of god to the former. Hess felt an immeasurable admiration for Hitler, as demonstrated by the fact that he was the first to use the expression, mein Führer, my guide, or my chief. When he mentioned the dictator, this shy follower who hated speaking in public seemed on the brink of amorous ecstasy. There are not grandiloquent enough words to describe the happiness that overwhelmed him for belonging to the innermost circle of the wolf, the nickname for Hitler. As he pointed out at the end of his speeches, 
on the verge of hysteria. With the owner of the Third Reich sitting by his side, who listened with a shy smile to the shower of praise, one could say that he even blushed when receiving public accolades from the most faithful of his men. In the end, Hess was not simply a high-ranking official. The Fuhrer never showed affection in front of the public. In fact, he literally avoided demonstrations of human warmth. His dog Blondie, the children, and strangely Rudolf Hess were the only ones who enjoyed gestures of affection in his public appearances. The relationship between Hitler and Hess has sparked much discussion over the years, so much so that there has even been speculation about a possible homosexual bond between them. Some witnesses even claim that, on occasion, they left Hitler's office arm in arm. Rumors soon surfaced, and the second's obsession with the Fuhrer earned him the nickname Fräulein Hess, or Miss Hess. His fanatical dedication bothered the early National Socialists, who accused the lieutenant of being an invert, a homosexual who had fallen faint of love for Hitler, and with whom he had homoerotic demonstrations of affection. The fact that it took him 10 years to have a child with his wife, Ilsa, only fueled those rumors. While the homosexual relationship between Hitler and his lieutenant could never be proven, many historians and specialists maintain and investigate this line. This love story had a tragic ending. Hess's betrayal when he went to Scotland to negotiate with the Allies hurt Hitler as much as the death of his niece. Even it is said that he cried. Supposedly, in his view, Hess had been the only true love of his life. Before finishing, we wanted to ask you, do you believe that Hitler truly had a homosexual affair with his right-hand man, Rudolf Hess? Leave your opinions in the comments below. We thank you for reaching the end and look forward to the next installments of military history.